Art. It's six, I guess, yeah. Yeah, six-ish. Ask Carl. Hello. Thank you, everyone. It's so good to say there are no seats up front. Okay. Um, so, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Phew, we can take a collective sigh. UCAs, this is like... We're heading home for the home stretch. Um, I'm Monica Virne Jimenez. I'm the executive director of UCEA. Um, before we get started with our program, I just want to make sure that we take a moment to thank the planning committee for this outstanding convention. So, Dr. Gerardo Lopez, who is our new president, Kevin Lawrence Henry, Erika Fernandez, and Frank Hernandez. Oh, there you go. So thank all of you for all your hard work, for putting so much of your heart and soul into this convention. And I, we invite all of you to the banquet. Hopefully you have your banquet tickets. I have been told to remind you of two things. One, the QR code on your name tag is your ticket to convention. So pull out the little card, do whatever you need to do, but don't forget your, um, your, to take your, Q, your, little, your name tag. The second thing is that the banquet actually begins at 6.15 in the lobby where we will have a second line to the banquet in Riverside, Riverview, Riverview. So if you are going to the banquet, or even if you're not going to the banquet, show up at 6.15 on the first floor, follow the band and the love and the folks heading over to the banquet. Once again, thank you so much. Enjoy. I know this is going to be an outstanding um, conversation and, and some, some deep learning going to be happening in the next hour or so. So thank you very much. And Kevin's coming up? Oh, no. Marsha? So I'm introducing Marsha? Okay. Marsha from Penn State University will get us kick started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marcia Modesti. I'm an assistant professor in the Educational Leadership Program in the Department of Education Policy Studies at the Pennsylvania State University. <laughs> the Mitzteifer Lecture honors the memory of the late Dr. Robert Mitzteifer, a graduate of Penn State University and is sponsored through Penn State and the support of his widow, Dr. Dorothy Mitzteifer, who is also a graduate of Penn State's College of Education. This year's Mitzteifer Lecture will be delivered by Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings, current president of the National Academy of Education and member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Gloria Ladson Billings is Professor Emerita and former Kellner Family Distinguished Chair in Urban Education in Curriculum and Instruction and faculty affiliate in the Departments of Educational Policy Studies, Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis, and Afro-American Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In the 2005-2006 academic year, Dr. Ladson Billings was the president of the American Educational Research Association. Dr. Ladson Billings research examines the pedagogical practices of teachers who are successful with African American students. She's also developed and advanced the application of critical race theory in educational research. In addition to writing critically acclaimed books, Dr. Ladson Billings has won numerous scholarly awards and is the recipient of seven honorary doctorates. On a personal note, one of my favorite classes from my doctoral studies at Wisconsin was Dr. Ladson Billings' Multicultural Perspectives on Education course, in which we read Rebecca Sklut's The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, and used Foucault's concept of the regime of truth to examine various novels, cinematic film, and educational research. At this time, I invite Dr. Kevin Lawrence Henry Jr. from the University of Arizona to come forth and deliver his introduction of Dr. Ladson Billings. Good afternoon, everyone. 
I hope you all are enjoying the conference. Um, my name is Kevin Henry, and I am an assistant professor at the University of Arizona. So how does one introduce a person who needs absolutely no introduction? Um, calling her a star would be too limited a word to describe Dr. Ladson Billings, for there are many stars in our wide, wide universe. However, there is only one moon, and that's the brightest among all the stars. The moon, my colleagues, is that which illuminates our night, giving us both light and direction. I suspect if Dr. Ladson Billings had not been born, our field would need to invent her. I first encountered Dr. Ladson Billings' the scholarship as an undergrad in my teacher preparation program, where oddly enough, her research was not assigned to our class. It was out of a deep ex um, frustration and sincere hope that there was something that could speak to the culturally uh, extracting, pathologizing, and deficit perspectives that were being easily tossed and digested by my fellow pre-service teachers and faculty. And it is in that space that I discovered Dr. Latson's Billings' pioneering work on culturally relevant pedagogy. Her magisterial text, The Dream Keepers, Successful Teachers of African American Children, and her article, Toward a, Theory, uh, Toward, excuse me, Toward a Theory of Culturally Relevant Pedagogy, literally changed the discourse of our field and has made deep interventions in how educators and leaders are prepared and what they actually do within schools. One could literally stop there in discussing Dr. Latson Billings' intellectual contributions, but that would be, again, too limited. In addition to her groundbreaking scholarship on culturally relevant pedagogy, Dr. Ladson Billings, uh, with former UW-Madison professor Dr. William F. Tate, introduced to the field what has been one of our central race-based theoretical frameworks, critical race theory. Critical race theory has literally shifted our disciplinary language, frames, knowledge, and interventions, opening up new terrains for research, teaching, policy, and advocacy, scores of dissertations, university level courses, both undergraduate and graduate, K-12 curriculum, and entire conferences and symposia have been created based on this work. Latson Billings' scholarship on critical race theory forces our field to take a trenchant examination of itself and to consider how our theorizing on race and racism, or lack thereof of theorizing, um, continues to reproduce racialized educational stratification and suffering. Her work on critical race theory provides scholars with guideposts for our own scholarship as we traverse the academy and unknown racial frontiers. Latson Billings can be known for her ability to reframe and reanimate. She's an inventor and a craftsperson. Two brief examples are necessary. First, in her 2006 American Educational Research Association presidential address, Latson Billings does what she is known to do, give us new ways to think and understand the world. In this address, Latson Billings provides us with a reframing of the achievement gap to an education debt. Her notions of the social funding of race and her work on hip hop education as well shows the groundbreaking and path clearing scholarship and has left really no serious educational space untouched. But beyond that, she is um, the consummate, consummate uh, faculty member. She has created and cultivated space for most of the most essential project of all and that is to hold the humanity of her students, colleagues, and those with whom she's in community. This is the lasting legacy of Dr. Ladson Billings. And I've undoubtedly failed at giving the proper introduction as someone such as Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings can't adequately be summed up, but perhaps her impact and magnitude can be felt and must be acknowledged. So without further delay, everyone please help me in welcoming Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings. Good afternoon. Special thank you to both Marcia and to Kevin for those lovely words. And thank you to all of you for coming out. Um, before I get started, it is probably appropriate to acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Tunica Biloxi as well as the Choctaw. Um, should not take those things for granted. 
that there were those who were here before us. And so we acknowledge their presence and the gift of this land um, that they did not willingly give, but that they did give and their presence should not be erased from our memories. Um, I also want to acknowledge that there's so many people in this room that I know so well, and I, I start calling names and one forget somebody, but there are some special folks in, in the room. This, this is my little table right here <laughs> with, with, with a couple add-ons to the side. <laughs> and I don't know how much mischief uh, Jim has made, so I'm not going to even acknowledge you. <laughs> but Kofi Lamote was a classmate of mine at Stanford. We made it through that uh, together, but there is uh, Judy Austin and Wanda, Patricia, Adrian, Shamika, Kevin, all people who are important to me uh, behind the scholarship. I think sometimes we get caught up with who has what title, who was in what job. Um, but it's the humanity of these folks that allow us to stay in these jobs. So, without further ado, let me get started. And I've titled these remarks, uh, and also, let, before I do that, let me also thank um, the conference program planners because they invited me and, you know, even though I had a faculty affiliate in ed leadership and policy analysis, it's, that's a nice way of saying we put you on dissertations a lot. Uh, uh, when uh, Marcia was reading all those affiliates, I turned to Judy and I said, you see that's four jobs and one check, one check, you know, so they, but uh, I do, I'm really honored to have been asked to do that, so to your program planners, and also to you, the members of UCEA, for this invitation to speak at your annual meeting. And I wanna bring you greetings from Wisconsin, a northern section of the Louisiana Purchase. <laughs> Learn your history, folks, all the way up there. Uh, but two things have informed my remarks today. First, we are meeting here in this historic and iconic city. And second, your conference theme, where yet validating subaltern forms of leadership and learning within and outside of schools. So putting those two things together helped me come up with the title, Good Gumbo Needs a Roo, the recipe for leading and learning from the bottom. So it doesn't take long for visitors to New Orleans to figure out that one of the distinctive things about the city and this region is the food. Po' boys, beignets, muffalettas, shrimp etouffee, bananas foster, and jambalaya all say New Orleans. But nothing says New Orleans like gumbo. Gumbo is a stew that is the official dish of Louisiana. Its roots are African and French Creole. The word gumbo likely comes from two of its ingredients, okra and filet. In the Niger-Congo languages spoken by many enslaved people from West Africa, the vegetable okra was known as ki ngombo or quingombo. The word is akin to the Umbundu Ochingombo and the uh, Teshubla Chingongombo. In the language of the indigenous Choctaw people, file or ground sassafras leaves was called combo. Gumbo, like many foods of African American culture, is something that people are quite particular about. <laughs> we don't eat everybody's mac and cheese. <laughs> their potato salad or gumbo. But we do agree that good gumbo needs a roof. Your conference focuses on leadership and reminds me of the work of sociologist John Brown Childs 
and his volume, Leadership, Conflict, and Cooperation in Afro-American Social Thought, which was published back in 1989. According to Childs, African-American leadership falls into two categories, vanguard and grassroots. Vanguard leaders include people like Frederick Douglass, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, Booker T. Washington, Martin Luther King, and Malcolm X. Grassroots leaders include people like Harriet Tubman, Marcus Garvey, Bayard Rustin, Ella Baker, and Fannie Lou Hamer. And while history gives great credit to the vanguard leader, close examination of social movements reveals that most change occurs because of the work of the grassroots leaders. They represent the subaltern, the people in the liminal spaces, those who may lack credentials and prestige. And I want to argue that by building on the way they do their work, we can really learn what it means to lead and learn from the bottom. So I want to take the rest of my time with you detailing the recipe for the gumbo that helps us lead and learn from subaltern spaces. The first thing that you must do to make a good gumbo is to create the roux. The roux is the entire base for the gumbo. It also symbolizes the masses who form the base for our research and our practice. A good gumbo requires a dark roux. That means that you must melt the butter, add the flour, and stir constantly over a medium-low heat. If you don't let it cook long enough, you may have something appropriate for a bechamel <laughs> to be used for macaroni and cheese. Now, it's not that there's no use to it, but you can't make gumbo with that, right? Or perhaps a gravy, right? But if you overcook it, the roux will burn and be unusable. A dark roux is rich and nutty and is the entire reason for gumbo. Think about it. No roux, no gumbo. No masses, no real social science research that matters. The next ingredient is water. Now it seems so basic, but it is a pervasive element of the gumbo. In this educational leadership gumbo, the water represents the society in which we exist. We are submerged in the tap water with all of its problems, pollutants, and impurities. We wish we had better water, but we use what we have in hopes that everything else that we include might mask the toxicity of the water. Often when we see the result of this toxic water, we want to blame those who partake of it. It is only when we see the extent to which this water is toxic do we acknowledge the water is the problem. The next ingredient is the trinity. Celery, onions, and peppers. This combination represents the plan, the strategy, and the action. Far too often in our attempt to lead from the top, we only talk plans. Du Bois talked talented 10th. Washington talked agriculture and industrial education. Malcolm talked black independence. Martin talked nonviolence. 
But Harriet talked live free or die. Bayard talked organization. Garvey talked about creating a homeland by us, for us. And as scholars, we write about what people need to do, but we do not design interventions for that doing. We do not organize work groups to make sure the design is implemented with fidelity. Grassroots leaders understand the need to bring together a plan, a strategy, and a course of action. Our strategies can and should be developed in classrooms and communities. Our actions should reflect what we do to move the plan and the strategies off the paper. At this point, it is time to add the sausage. <laughs> Spicy and mild. The meat of the gumbo is the substance. What's the point of developing plans, strategies, okay. <laughs> I'm good, but I can't see in the dark. <laughs> I'm sure this is just about a button, thank you. So I ask, what is the point of developing plans, strategies, and actions without some substantive product? The challenge that most graduate students encounter is that they have vague and often grandiose ideals, elaborate strategies, and detailed plans. But to what end? The essential question that good advisors push you towards is not just for the document, that will become your dissertation. It is for what will become the substance of your life work. My intellectual substance has always revolved around the ongoing educational disparity that black people experience. Whether I have looked at black students' conceptions of citizenship, pedagogical approaches to teaching black students well, critical race analysis of inequity, youth culture contributions to black students' learning, a more recently racialized housing policy as a contributor to educational disparity, the ongoing educational disparity of black students has remained at the center of my inquiry. That is my substance. What is yours? Well, now it's time to add the okra. This is the vegetable from which gumbo gets its name. Its origins are in dispute with West Africa, Ethiopia, and South Asia as likely sites of origin. First used around 1670, as I said earlier, the name okra is from a West African language, possibly Igbo. It has uh, origin around 1805, becoming the name gumbo used in parts of the southeastern United States and the English-speaking Caribbean via Portuguese and Spanish queen gumbo. Okra is a mucilaginous portion of the plant. Anybody who just was asked to just eat the okra know that's not their favorite part. It, it, it needs to, you need to fry it or batter it or do something else or put it in the gumbo. But that portion of the plant results in the characteristic goo, or the slime when it's cooked. Okra in our work represents the muck and mire of the process. Any scholar working in communities of those who have been marginalized or are in those liminal positions of alterity will have to get down in the goo to get accurate information that will inform the research. When I think of this aspect of the research enterprise, I'm reminded of scholar Vanessa Siddle Walker, who makes the distinction between data and real data. According to Siddle Walker, her work that resulted in the book, Their Highest Potential, an African-American school community in the segregated South, 
It involves lots of sitting and rocking and drinking sweet tea. You have to do this in order to get your participants to open up and honestly share with you. Far too much of the education research in communities of colors involve what I've called drive-by research, where university people dip in and out of the community, get some data, and make some claims. That kind of research attempts to avoid the stickiness and the goo that emerges in complex relationships. The next ingredient is seafood. Now this could include crab meat and oysters. The seafood is fresh, not frozen. It reflects the flavors and authenticity of the region where your work is done. So when I moved to the Midwest, I knew that my research would have to take place beyond my physical location. Don't get me wrong. I like living and working in Wisconsin. But my research passions and the questions that most interest me can only be explored in limited ways there, outside of Madison and Milwaukee and perhaps Beloit and Racine. I have to look to students, teachers, and parents in other parts of the country to get a fuller and more authentic look of urban education. My crab meat is in Philadelphia, <laughs> or Baltimore, or Oakland, or Detroit. The next ingredient in the gumbo are the seasonings, or the spices. The point of the spice is to bring out the flavor. And unfortunately, some people cannot appreciate the value of the spices. Oh, this is too spicy, they decry. <laughs> what they want is something bland and tasteless because that does not disturb their palate. <laughs> Often graduate students or untenured colleagues come to advisors or mentors with questions that run counter to the experiences of many in the academy. So they hear things such as, this is too narrow. Oh, if you focus on this, you won't be marketable. This is not fundable, or this won't get you tenure. The problem is people who absorb this advice find themselves traveling down a road far away from the work that needs to be done to lead and learn from the subaltern. So instead of making gumbo, they end up making soup. <laughs> Finally, good gumbo requires us to add the shrimp. We add the shrimp last, because if we put it in too early, it becomes rubbery. If our work is with and in support of the subaltern, the shrimp is where the academics show up. No one in these communities wants to hear about the theory, the review of the literature, the methodologies, or the analysis. They want to know about the findings and the implications. What do you now know about our situation and what can be done to improve it? This is the place where the shrimp can take center stage. Now procedurally, we're at a point where we let this marvelous concoction simmer. This is where we think out the work and let all the ingredients come together. It is also the place where we can taste to see if our seasonings come through and reflect on the adjustments that we must make in the process. Now before the gumbo aficionados in the audience start attacking me for leaving out the garlic or the filet powder or whatever that secret ingredient your grandmama includes, <laughs> Let me reiterate that I'm using gumbo as a metaphor <laughs> for our work. I am not sharing my good gumbo recipe. <laughs> okay. 
However, at this point, I want to make sure that we can do something in our work to address the concerns and real life problems of the subaltern. So here are some of the practicalities that we must consider. First, let's spend some time theory generating. Some of us buy the notion that theory is a frivolous activity, but university-based researchers are uniquely positioned to do theory generating and theory testing. One of the things that one of my Stanford professors uh, once said to me was a quote from the psychologist Kurt Lewin, there is nothing so practical as a good theory. When we do work with good theory, it helps guide the entire enterprise. Second, know the literature. This seems so obvious that some may wonder why I'm even bringing it up. However, far too many projects we begin reflect our lack of knowledge about the subject area. We might think we're doing something novel, but without doing the requisite reading, we do not know the field well enough. In 2004, the year before I became the American Educational Research Association president, I made a concerted effort to read every available presidential address before my tenure. Several presidents before me used the theme, educational research in the public interest. However, none of them approached the topic from a critical race theory lens. But I used the literature as a way to ensure I was not covering ground that others had already covered. Third, ask the right question. Far too often, students approach us with statements that go something like, I'm interested in voucher programs, or I want to study funding equity. I want to study black women school superintendents. And each time I hear statements like that, I feel compelled to re redirect students with the words, what is your research question? We all have topics in which we are deeply interested but having a topic is not the same as having a research question. And not having a research question means that you are likely to find yourself doing some form of journalism rather than research. Number four, be prepared to be wrong. When you live in a world fraught with inequity, you are tempted to believe your view of it is the right view. But if your work is true research, you have to be prepared to be incorrect about your hunches. Being wrong can be illuminating. It can challenge extant theory. It can force new thinking, and it can lead to new solutions. My work that resulted in the volume, The Dream Keepers, started with my assuming that teacher curriculum selection would influence student success. And after spending time listening to the teachers and observing their practices, I could see how wrong my assumptions were, and I was prepared to be wrong. Number five, learn to listen. In truth, this should probably be the first thing we do as we work with disenfranchised and subaltern communities, even when we can rightly declare that we are members of those communities. Uh, excuse me, even when we declare that we can rightly declare that we are members of the communities that we study, by virtue of the fact that we have some standing in the academy, we are not full members of those communities. If we are going to do research in and with communities, our obligation is to listen, to learn the needs and desires of the communities. It's also important for us to listen to exactly what community members are saying. In some instances, we presume we understand what people are saying or what they mean by their actions. I once observed a student teacher in a civics classroom, and the cooperating teacher was teaching a lesson and stopped in the middle of the lesson, and he noticed that one of the students was chewing gum. 
and he immediately told the student, drop and give me 20. The student went to the back of the room and did 20 push-ups. I was appalled. However, a little while later, I learned that the teacher had set his class up as a democracy. And the students wrote all the laws and the sanctions. And one of the laws was no gum chewing. And the punishment for violating the law was 20 push-ups for boys and writing I will not chew gum in class 100 times for girls. This seemingly unreasonable and sexist set of punishments <laughs> was actually set up by the students. Eventually, they learned that their rules were untenable, and they had to convene a class council to change the legislation. But I had to learn to listen, to see what the teacher was doing to help the students understand the consequences of laws and policies. Number six, know your methodology. While it's possible to have sound theory, know the literature, and come up with a researchable question, the research can go awry if you do not have sound methodology. Many proposals never receive funding because the methodology is not well specified or appropriate for the research question. Our work that reflects what Catherine Imahovich calls engaged scholarship or public scholarship requires more complex and nuanced methods. We have to stop writing grounded theory, Strauss and Corbin, 1990, <laughs> or critical ethnography, Carr Speckin, 1995. And instead, we need to take the time to explain what we are actually doing. Interviewing means nothing without a clear description of how and why we plan to conduct those interviews. My dream keepers were a part of a uh, strategy known as group conversation method. It was developed by Du Bois and Lai. And one of the most important things that colleagues have shared with me that have used my book is when they use it in the methodologies, like we have to then go back and dig and figure out what this group conversation method is. Finally, I'm ending on number seven, Judy, because you know what that is, right? Yeah, that's, okay. But take your time. And this is probably the hardest thing to hear about our work. We have been socialized and governed by deadlines. Our tenure and promotion clocks tick incessantly. Editors and proposals set submission dates. Dates hang over our heads like the sword of Damocles. But thoughtful work designed to change and improve life outcomes for people takes time. Sometimes the compromise may be publishing sections of our work, a theoretical piece, or a review of the literature, or a methodological article before we publish the findings we may have to consider in the publication process. We also have to consider publishing in venues other than the approved high-impact venues, blogs, community newspapers, podcasts, and practitioner journals are available and make our work more accessible to the subaltern that we claim we want to lead and learn from. Now, it would be naive of me to suggest that those of us who make our living in the academy can ignore the rules and norms of academic life. Yes, we must write and publish in academic journals. Indeed, we must seek external funding. And of course, we must teach and provide service. But what I am saying is that there are ways to integrate those demands that allow you to be in collective struggle and service to people who have limited access to the academy. You do not have to make 
either or choices when both and options are available. I have an image etched in my mind from 35 years ago. My late mother traveled from Philadelphia to Palo Alto, California to see me walk across the stage at Stanford University. She could not have been more proud. One evening at my home, she was anxious to see the dissertation, the book that made it happen. And I handed her my hefty 300-page tome with pride. And my mother, although a mere high school graduate, was an avid reader and wordsmith. Daily, she completed three crossword puzzles, and one of them was the New York Times. However, as she turned the pages of my dissertation, I could see the looks of puzzlement and confusion on her face. She was proud of me, but it appeared to me that what I had committed to that document made me less understandable to her. I did the dissertation by following the rules of the academy but the document was not in service to the community in which I had done the research. I made a commitment then and there to write to an audience that could actually benefit from what I was doing. True, I do publish in esoteric journals like the Educational Researcher and the American Educational Research Journal and even law reviews but I have simultaneously found ways to speak to broader audiences, to remember the root. It is from that base that I got my start, and it is to that base that I owe my greatest allegiance. I understand that good gumbo needs a root. Thank you. I was just checking to see if we're going to do questions, so it sounds like we are. Okay, we have a few minutes. Okay. So I'm happy to entertain any questions. Are those, are those mics live? Do you know? Yes. So if you have a question, I think you can just step to one of the mics. I'll be happy to try to answer it for you. So I'll tell you this little story while somebody makes their way to, to the microphone. Uh, so one of the things that I do when I am out in Palo Alto and, and visiting Stanford, uh, Stanford uh, houses a lot of his dissertations in the School of Education's library. And every time I go, I pull mine out and I misshelve it. Because I really don't want anybody to read that. And so I, I, I shared that with uh, another classmate, and he told me, he said, look, I put $20 in my dissertation. And he said, and every time I go out there, it's still right there. <laughs> he, said, he, said, he said, ain't nobody reading these things. So I mean, I think it, it, it just reminds us that we get caught up and think these are the most important things we'll ever do. And uh, they don't actually impact people's lives in the way that we think. So. So, did we get a question from someone? There you go, thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, oh. You mentioned that communities, they want to hear about the findings and the implications. I was also wondering, or thinking that it must be important for us to try and translate the theories, as you mentioned, that are so important to guide our work, because those have the power to transform our like collective um, common sense. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on how to make those relevant when we speak to the broader audiences that we engage with as well. 
Well, given the kind of work I do, one of the things that I have learned is that the stuff that I think of as high theory, uh, people in the communities go, yeah, oh, we already knew that, right? <laughs> so when I talk to communities about critical race theory and how the permanence of racism and and you know, you can't ever get anything done until you can get with this, you know, do this interest convergence with the power structure. They're like, yeah, and? <laughs> so often, what we've codified as high theory is commonsensical to these communities. So I, 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 I don't mean to suggest that it's beyond them. It's that what it is is that they already know a lot of this stuff. Now we can share with them, this is how you, this is what you might call it, in case you're going for some community grants or whatever because the, your grantor will want to see the theory. But I don't think that, um, you know, I, I think they can, I think they benefit from the theory, they benefit from understanding why things are working in a particular way, but they often already know the theory. Yeah. Got another question right quick? <laughs> Kofi said I said it all. Okay. Okay, well thank you very much. I appreciate it.